to review a little bit uh, what we discussed last time. So I talk about uh, uh, three problems, uh, which I call reality of black holes. So tests of reality of black holes, rather. Uh, so what, it, what this means is that uh, you are in the context of general relativity, so you have uh, manifolds, and you can talk about higher dimensions also, but I will stay in 1 plus 3, in the physical dimension. Uh, so a four-dimensional manifold, a metric G, which is Lorentzian, and uh, which verifies the Einstein vacuum equations. In other words, uh, Ricci part of the Riemann curvature tensor of G is equal to zero. Right? And of course, uh, I put myself into the asymptotically flat regime. There are many other interesting regimes. I mean, there is a cosmological regime, for example, uh, which obviously I will not be talking about at all. But there are many other problems, uh, extremely interesting in other contexts. Uh, there is also a cosmological constant, for example, that you can play with, and so on and so forth. But I will just talk about the, the simplest case, in a sense, which is uh, this one, Ricci equal to zero. Uh, so the Einstein equations in vacuum. So we discussed that uh, these equations are deformorphism invariant. In other words, <coughs> you have to identify phi star of g with g, where phi is any deformorphism of m into itself. So for any diffeomorphism of M into itself, you have this huge class of equivalents of, uh, of solutions of the Einstein equations up to dif any diffeomorphism. All right, so uh, once you take that into account, the equations are hyperbolic. So once, once you stress out the important, I mean, so once you mod out by this gauge group, you can see that the equations are hyperbolic. In other words, the notion of hyperbolicity is really a gauge invariant. It is a gauge dependent, sorry, gauge dependent condition in a sense. Uh, at least in the simplest possible definition, uh, it will be gauge dependent. Uh, then uh, we talked about uh, the initial value problem. So once it's hyperbolic, you talk about the initial value formulation, right? So, which means that you start with a three dimensional manifold a metric which is Riemannian, and the second fundamental form. So maybe I'll write it like this, sigma jk. And, uh, and then you study uh, developments of these initial data sets. <coughs> are solutions of the Einstein equations, in other words, are four-dimensional. So this is three-dimensional. So you're looking at four-dimensional uh, solutions, which uh, when restricted to uh, sigma, you uh, you get back this uh, first and second fundamental forms. Right. Okay, so, uh, and then I talked about stationary solutions. And, and I said that uh, obviously uh, very often when, uh, whenever you talk about any kind of nonlinear partial differential equations or even ordinary differential equations, but partial differential equations, uh, the first step, in a sense, of understanding the general evolution is to really understand the stationary states or to classify the stationary states. So, uh, so in the context we talked about, it turns out that people have discovered a large family of such stationary states, which are parameterized by two parameters, A and M. A Typically, we want A to be less or equal to M. Otherwise, there are all sorts of issues which make this uh, the case when A larger than N unphysical. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, once you have, uh, once we, we discussed that, I talked about the final state conjecture. So this is a very general and uh, extremely difficult conjecture and very deep. Uh, which uh, contains many other uh, simply simpler kind of conjecture, simpler kind of problems, which by themselves are huge conjectures, right? So we discussed the final state conjecture. <laughs> uh, 
uh, says that uh, it applies to generally initial data sets. So you start with initial data sets, which are asymptotically flat, but eventually very large. Uh, and uh, and the, the picture that one has in mind with the final state is that after uh, asymptotically, after a lot of very complicated dynamics takes place, you are going to see the emergence of only a finite number of black holes, uh, which are care solutions. So in other words, a finite number of stationary states, which are the, these care solutions, which uh, diverge from each other. Okay? So in other words, in any finite region of space, you are going to see just one black hole. OK, so this is, uh, this is a final state conjecture, and, uh, uh, which is, of course, completely out of reach at this time. There are similar such conjecture for other equations, which are much simpler, but for general relativity, there is nothing even remotely close. Uh, however, there are simpler uh, questions that one can ask, which, as I said, by themselves are, are, a, are a huge conjecture. One of them is stability of Minkowski space. Stability of Minkowski, which <laughs> is connected with the finite set conjecture in the sense that if the initial data is sufficiently close to the flat initial data, in other words, it's small, it's small perturbation of Minkowski space, uh, you will get solutions which look like Minkowski space in the large. So asymptotically, they look like Minkowski space. There are no black holes. So you don't have emergence of black holes. The problem of collapse, the, the problem of collapse, collapse, which is that uh, if the data is sufficiently large, you could form a stationary state. Therefore, you can form a black hole. And uh, this, obviously, is very interesting, uh, both mathematical and physical, from physical point of view. Then there is a, the problem of rigidity, which is to classify. It's a problem of classification of stationary states. How do you know that the final states are only care solutions? Maybe there are others. The classification, uh, will, the classification of rigidity co conjecture is that all stationary states have to be care solutions. There is a, the problem of stability. The problem of stability, which is uh, that uh, if you make a small perturbation of a Kerr solution, you stay in the Kerr class. You are not going to create something else. This is a, by itself a huge problem which has not yet been solved and which are, about which I will talk. And then uh, finally, there is a cosmic censorship conjecture which is even beyond all this, is something even more complicated, which by itself is a huge conjecture. So this is cosmic censorship conjecture. And then, in addition, there are other problems which have to do with the n-body, so-called n-body. So there is an analogous of the n-body problem in, in classical mechanics. There is an analogous, of course, in, in general relativity, which is obviously extremely important. In particular, it, it's really the two-body problem the understanding of two-body problem, which is connected with uh, recent LIGO experiments of uh, gravitational waves, right? Uh, all right, so anyway, so the, the problem that I, I talked, I then said that I'm going to talk about, I'll talk also about stability of Minkowski space, but uh, mainly as far as black holes are concerned, I want to talk about the problem of collapse, rigidity, and, and stability. So last time we talked, I gave an introduction in the problem of rigidity. And, uh, and also in the problem of collapse, and I didn't have time to introduce the problem of stability, but I'll do it later. Uh, and uh, today I thought I'll go in uh, more depth about the rigidity problem, and I will start talking about stability. And maybe collapse, if we have time, we'll discuss it at the very end. Uh, I mean, I will go more in depth, in other words, on collapse. Okay, so let's, let's start now, unfortunately. It's, this is not... I have to make it full. OK, so I'll talk uh, about the problem of rigidity. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe I'll remind from last time we had a discussion, first of all, of, uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately, where is the light one? Right. So we had the um, Schwarzschild solution. So first of all, the Minkowski space. So this was uh, minus, so the metric here is minus dt squared plus, in polar coordinates, plus dr squared plus 
d sigma squared, where th this is, <laughs> this is uh, uh, say, if we are in, in one plus three dimensions, again, this would be the standard, the standard metric on the two sphere. Uh, and uh, then the Schwarzschild solution, which is a bit more complicated, which is, uh, has uh, 1 minus 2m over r <coughs> dt squared plus 1 minus 2m over r to the minus 1 dr squared plus r squared uh, plus uh, this, uh, I should say here, an r squared plus r squared d sigma squared, which is, again, this is a, the standard metric on the unit sphere. All right? And then finally, the Kerr solution, which is even more complicated, uh, but which hopefully soon I'll be able to show you again on the... So uh, let's draw a picture of the Schwarzschild solution here. So here is a, a, a way of representing the Schwarzschild solution, which is, which is uh, very useful. Uh, so to start with, we see that uh, we have this r equal to 2m here, right? And r equal to 2m here. So this corresponds to that value that, uh, that uh, we, we see in the metric. Uh, and as I mentioned last time, uh, if you look at the metric, it looks like you are singular at r equal to 2m, right? So uh, in reality, that singularity is purely a singularity due to the coordinate. So it's very similar to what happens uh, when you write down uh, Mikoski space, for example, in polar coordinates, you get, you get a singularity uh, at the origin, but that singularity, of course, is just due to the, your bad choice of coordinates. The same thing here, of course, even though this is more complicated, the same thing uh, happened here, and as I mentioned last time, it took people a long time to realize that uh, that singularity uh, was actually a coordinate singularity and not a serious singularity of the space-time itself. So once you understand that, uh, you realize that you can change coordinates and go across uh, this hypersurface, and that therefore this hypersurface is actually completely, completely smooth. Once you, and in fact, it turns out that this r equal to 2m is just the, the, it's just the boundary between the black hole region. So this is the black hole, and this is the <laughs> domain of outer communication. So exterior. Right? So this is, uh, so in fact, you have two such things. You have one on this side and one on this side. Uh, and uh, uh, you also have what is called the white hole, but this is of no interest to us because th this definitely uh, is not supposed to happen ever in evolution. In evolution, you're only going to see either this side or this side. And uh, uh, everything, then at infinity, so you see, you, you look at the values of r, so you, you have interesting values of r, r equal r, r equal 0, r equal to 2m, r larger than 2m. There is also here of interest r equal 3m, which I already mentioned last time, and then you have r equal to infinity, and uh, which is represented here in the, by a conformal compactification, uh, in other words, by conformally compactifying the metric, you can actually uh, see that uh, r equal infinity will correspond to what is called uh, a boundary at infinity, which is called scry. There is a scry plus and scry minus, <laughs> right? So this corresponds exactly to r equal to infinity, <laughs> r equal infinity. And uh, uh, there are, uh, there is this region here of r equal to 3m, so this is important uh, in the discussion that we are going to have because you can, uh, uh, you can have geodesics, so null geodesics, in principle null geodesics in this picture are at 45 degrees going either this way or this way. The ones uh, which go this way will go to infinity, so they, they go for uh, infinite time along, along uh, proper time of the, of the null geodesic. And the ones which uh, go in this direction, of course, will, hit, will, will, will go into the black hole. Once they go into the black hole, they will hit a singularity 
at r equal to 0. So r equal to 0, unlike r equal to 2m, is a true singularity. Uh, in other words, the curvature will blow up. Uh, therefore, the metric cannot, in, cannot be extended in any way. In any reasonable way, you cannot extend the, the metric beyond r equal to 0. All right, so, uh, uh, so at r equal to 3m, as I said, there are, however, in addition to these geodesics, which, which you, uh, are easy, easy to visualize because this picture, of course, is a picture in RT. You don't see the other coordinates, right? The theta and phi are not seen in this picture. But if you take that into account, uh, the theta and phi, in other words, you look at the more complicated uh, uh, family of geodesics, you see geodesics that stay, uh, that are tangent, actually, on r equal to 3m. In other, in other words, they, this will be now geodesics with, which don't go into the black hole, and they don't go to infinity. And therefore, uh, from the point of view of geometric optics, right? From the point of view of geometric optics, these are good. I mean, the ones that go inside, you never see them again. The ones that go to infinity, you also don't see them again. The ones that stay here forever are actually going to influence the dynamics in a major way. Okay, so uh, first of all, the Kerr family, which you see, it's a little bit more complicated than Schwarzschild family, but still, it's amazingly uh, concrete, it's amazingly compact as a, as a solution. It admits rotations. It admits rotations, of course. The whole point is that it admits rotation. It has two uh, killing vector fields. It has uh, T, which is D over DT, which you see immediately, uh, and you have a second one, which is D over D phi, relative to these coordinates, right? So, uh, so it's an axially symmetric, axis symmetric stationary uh, solution. And, and in this class, which depends on the two parameters a and m, if you take a to be zero and then positive, you get the second solution, which is a Schwarzschild solution, which I mentioned earlier. Okay, so let's, let's go to the picture. So this is a picture of Schwarzschild, which I started to draw there. So you see the, these two regions, which are external to the black hole. This is the black hole. This would be the white hole region. This is, uh, again, the exterior region uh, now. Uh, I need to emphasize that we are interested Whenever we study uh, black holes from the point of view of, uh, of this uh, province which I mentioned, we are discussing it away from, from the horizon. So in other words, we are, we are interested in this region all the way to ho the horizon, maybe a little bit in, inside the horizon, but certainly we are not interested in uh, truly in the black hole region, which terminates in a singularity. And it, there are many other problems of uh, great interest uh, which deal with that but uh, I'm not going to deal with that at all. So the event horizon r equal to 2m, as I mentioned. Metric can be extended past it. As we, as we mentioned, there is no, this is not a true singularity. Uh, you can have uh, black and white holes, which are for r in the region r less than 2m. The exterior domains are defined by r larger than 2m. Uh, the photon sphere which is, I just started to talk about, is this region at r equals 3m, when you, have, you can have null geodesics which stay there forever. Okay? And that creates problems from the point of view of uh, geometric optics and, and uh, have uh, an impact on the dynamics of the solutions. Null infinity, which corresponds to these boundaries, right? so here and here, uh, and they are uh, there, r is equal to infinity, in fact. And of course, you would have two of them, one to the past and one to the future. Of course, the, in dynamics, we're interested in the future. So obviously, I will only be interested in Scry plus. OK, so that's a, that's a situation uh, of uh, the Schwarzschild. Now, Kerr is, is very similar. You still have a black hole region. You have the, these two exterior regions. Again, I'm interested in just one of them. Again, you have the picture here is very similar to the one of the exterior of Schwarzschild. But uh, in the interior, things are slightly different because it, they don't terminate at r equal to 0, uh, which, is, which is singularity. They terminate, in fact, in one of the two roots of this delta. Delta, if you remember, it's exactly the polynomial r squared plus a squared minus 2m over r, which is, uh, 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 which is quadratic. And therefore, you have two roots, uh, one of the root <laughs> corresponds to a boundary of the black hole region, and uh, it's called the Cauchy horizon. And again, it's very interesting. There's a lot of interesting mathematics, but I will not talk about it. I'll talk only about the event horizon, 
which is now r plus, r plus is one of the roots of r square plus a square minus 2m over r, it's actually the bigger root, okay? All right, so again, external region, event horizon at r equal to r plus, the black hole region, null infinity, similar to what we had before. This is the external part of the black hole, right? And again, uh, I, this is something I said last time, that uh, if you look at the stationary Keeling vector field, which is d over dt, I write it here as capital T, this one in the asymptotic region, so asymptotic region is, of course, the region where r is very big, right? r goes to infinity. So very close to scry in this picture. So there, the, the space time becomes Minkowskian. So if you look at care, you see immediately that for r large, the uh, uh, care metric looks like a Minkowski metric. And therefore, this one looks like a d over dt in Minkowski space. And obviously, it's time-like. It's time-like, but as you, as you come close to the horizon, it switches and it becomes space-like, right? And this is a major difficulty that we mentioned last time. Uh, this uh, non-empty ergo region, so ergo region exactly is a place where T becomes space-like, uh, which is the region near the, uh, near the horizon. And you can have all sorts of problems like non-positive energy and so on and so forth, right? So this is actually very important in, in this rigidity issue that I, I mentioned. And then there is another, uh, there is another thing about, uh, of interest, which is the region of trapped null geodesics. So again, you can have trapped null geodesics, but now they are much more complicated than in Schwarzschild because they don't sit on just one hypersurface. So there are plenty of them in a, in a certain region, which is, let's say, close to R equals 3M if A is small, but it can become quite large if A is large. So if A becomes like M, the region of trapped geodesis can go all the way to the horizon, right? Okay, so anyway, so this region of trapped geodesics also, of course, plays a fundamental role in the problem of rigidity, and I'll, I'll mention. Okay, so here are some other properties of care solution. So, care is quite remarkable. I mean, it, 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 it really has uh, absolutely beautiful mathematical structure. Uh, to start with, as I mentioned last time, uh, you are interested in null frames, right? So in particular, you are interested in null pairs, E3 and E4, right? And then associated to uh, null pair, you have a null frame, right? So the null pair is given by two null vectors, E3 and E4, which are normalized such that the metric G of E3, E4 is minus two. Okay, so these are normalized by that condition, but they are both null. And then uh, you look at the space perpendicular to them. Okay, so at every point you have such a space. So this is infinitesimally. At every point you pick up vector fields E, e A, A equal one and two, which are perpendicular to these two and which are orthonormal among themselves, right? So these are space-like vectors and these two are null. So in the particular case when I pick my frame to be exactly this one, this null frame to be exactly, this null pair I should say, to be exactly this one, then uh, uh, a remarkable thing happens with the curvature. So the curvature of course in principle is very complicated, right? And it has lots of components. The curvature has in normally in four dimensions has 20 components because of Ricci flat it actually should have 10 components, right? But it turns out that almost all of them are zero in this frame. So if you calculate components of R relative to this frame, so in other words, if I take EA, E4, EB, E4, so R has four places, so I take R of EA, E4, EB, E4, I get what is called alpha, so please remember, I'll, I'll talk again, so uh, I'll talk many times about the, these components. Uh, they play an important role in stability also. Anyway, I have alpha, which is this, alpha bar, which is by symmetry obtained when you interchange four with a three. So this is alpha bar. And then you have the other components, which are beta, beta bar, and uh, rho and rho star, okay? So you see, if you calculate, you get two components here because of the trace of our condition. You get two components here, so it's four, six, eight, and two more, so you get 10. So 10 components. So this is called the null decomposition of the curvature relative to this frame. And uh, it has exactly all the degrees of freedom that you need. And uh, the remarkable thing is that for this particular frame, everything is zero with the exception of these last two. Okay, so there is some magical diagonalization that goes on. 
And uh, as a consequence, uh, f alpha, beta, beta bar, alpha bar are equal to zero. And the only thing that su survive is r plus i star. And unfortunately, you don't see it here. I don't know why. OK, so, uh, so in any case, you see that uh, this can actually be calculated exactly in this boiler link with coordinates. And they get a very simple, uh, a very simple form. Right? What is this star? R? Yeah, so the, the rho star, you see, is defined relative to the Hodge dual. So I, I take the Hodge dual of R. Anyway, so this is some algebraic, simple algebraic fact. But uh, uh, anyway, the consequence, uh, this is what you have. There, there, is, there is a beautiful duality uh, in, in general relativity, especially in four dimensions, which actually uh, plays an important role, of course, in physics. All right, so now uh, there is, in, in, uh, rigidity, in the rigidity problem, there is another important property of care that is worthwhile understanding. Uh, and that's, uh, that's called the Mars-Simon tensor. So what I, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the Mars-Simon tensor because it will play some role. So uh, you see stationarity, so let me explain it on the blackboard. So stationarity means that there is a killing vector field. So in other words, I'm not talking just about care. Now I'm talking about a general stationary solution. So if I have a, a general stationary solution, I, that means that Lt of g is equal to 0. Right? But if you look at uh, what this means, it means that uh, if I take uh, the covariant derivative of the alpha t beta, this plus d beta t alpha, this is equal to 0. So this is a so-called Keening equation, which follows immediately from this definition. And therefore, f alpha beta, which you see there, it's the alpha t beta, is a two-form, right? Because it's anti-symmetric. So it's a two-form. Two and uh, uh, I can take its complexified. I can complexify it by taking as a two-form, I, I can define the Hodge dual of the two-form. So this is f star of alpha beta. And I take f plus i, square root of minus 1, in other words, of f. And I do exactly the same thing for the curvature. I take r to be r plus i times the dual of r. Okay, so I get a complexified curvature and complexified, complexified f. Uh, the uh, remarkable thing about f is that d alpha of f beta gamma delta verifies a simple equation, which again, it's a consequence of the fact that t is stationary. So this follows relatively easy that you get this equation. I should, should have t here. That I, I made a mistake. That should be t. And that means that if I take i t, so in other words, if I, if I take uh, the contraction of f with t, so f alpha beta t beta, that's what I mean here. So please uh, read it as t rather than z t rather than z. So anyway, so it means that d of this one form, right? Because now this, is a one, this was a two form. If I take the contraction, I get a one form. d of it is equal to 0. It means, for simple topological reasons, it means that uh, this quantity is given by exterior derivative of a scalar, right? And this is called the n's potential. Yes? Uh, just one question. The r is the uh, Riemann tensor? Yeah, so R here is the Riemann curvature tensor, exactly. Uh, and the Hodge dual of the... Uh, How do you define the Hodge dual? Uh, 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 so the Riemann tensor is a four tensor. Yes, a four tensor. Four, so uh, the Hodge dual is not a scalar. OK, so you define it like this. You, 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 you define it as, uh, so if I take this to be mu nu, I define it as epsilon gamma delta mu nu. OK, this is... Uh, are dual gamma delta, uh, alpha beta gamma delta, excuse me, <laughs> alpha beta gamma delta. So alpha beta gamma delta is defined like this, where this is just the volume form in four dimensions. Right? So in other words, I act only on two of the indices, not on all four. Right? OK. So uh, uh, OK, so th th this is just a, uh, I needed all this, you know, the, so I need this sigma, as you see, this is called the n's potential and plays a very important role. Uh, so now I use this complex curvature plus a combination of a quantity which is defined 
with respect to f, it's a quadratic quantity in f, and you, you can simply define it like this. Q alpha beta mu nu is alpha, is f times f, minus this, and this is a tensor, a complex tensor, which plays somehow the role, again, of a, sort of a complexified uh, volume form. Okay, we see it here. It has this part, which is exactly the volume form, and then the real part is given by this, right? Anyway, so you, you can create, in other words, a, an interesting tensor, which is formed by these two. And the remarkable thing is that if you are exact, first of all, in, in care, you can calculate these quantities. You can calculate f, f squared, and you can calculate this one. So sigma is exactly 1 minus 2m divided by this. And uh, the remarkable thing is that uh, s is 0 in care. Okay, that's just a calculation. It's not too difficult. So s vanishes in care. But remarkably, and this is a theorem of uh, Mars in 1999, the condition that s is equal to 0 makes sense, of course, for any stationary solution, right? Whenever I have a t, I can construct uh, this mass simon tensor. So the uh, mass, ten mass result says that uh, s equal to 0 characterizes care locally. So in other words, this mass simon tensor plays the same role as the Riemann curvature tensor plays uh, in Riemannian geometry. It characterizes the care solution, right? Okay, so that's an important concept. So, so any solution which has a killing vector and satisfies s equal to zero is has to be locally, has to be uh, isometric to the care solution. Yes. It has to be like uh, physiologically time-like. Yeah. So it, obviously, it has to be. It has to be uh, time-like, but not necessarily time-like. You only need it to be asymptotically time-like. Yes. But why asymptotically if it's a local vector? What if it's a local theorem? Because it characterizes care everywhere, even in the ergo region, right? So you, you, know, you always expect an ergo region, right? So we always expect a place where T will have to become space-like, right? So it's always time-like in where you are far away, but it could become space-like in the ergo region. And uh, in the ergo region, of course, you have to, uh, you also have, this s equal to zero characterizes the entire care, not just uh, not just uh, the asymptotic part. But I understand the entire care, but locally, what's the, I, I yeah, but locally at every point, locally at every point, in particular in points in the ergo region. That's what I mean. But then, then it's not local; it characterizes it globally. I understand. I don't understand this theorem. Can you state the best? Is it even if you want to have it global, you need additional conditions at infinity, right? That's that's all uh, you you need. I mean, the the way. I, Without, without giving additional conditions at infinity, the only thing I can say is that in a neighborhood I, uh, of any point, I can show that if the mass time tensor is zero, the space time is care, but it can be care in a different, with a different, in, different, in whatever different morphism, right? So to get the, exactly the care solution the way we know it, you need, you need also some kind of global conditions, All right? But anyway, for the moment, I think the local characterization is good enough. Uh, so uh, let's go back to the rigidity conjecture, which I mentioned last time. So the rigidity conjecture says that the Kerr family exhausts all stationary asymptotically for the regular vacuum black hole. So of course, you need a notion, uh, a general notion of stationary solution, right, which we discussed last time. And then you want to show that uh, with a definition of a, of a black hole solution, in other words, a stationary solution, which, which has certain properties, uh, you, uh, under uh, these conditions, you, you, you show that, uh, that the space time has to be care. Right? Of course, you always talk about stationary solutions of the Einstein equations, obviously, of the Einstein vacuum equations. Okay, so, uh, so this is what we were uh, two days ago. Uh, we started to, I started to tell you what is known. So there is a, a known result in the static case, uh, which I'm not going to m mention anymore. I mentioned it last time. This is, uh, 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 the state of this result is, is very, very good. In other words, we really underst understand the static case in uh, full generality. So the axially symmetric case is actually is much more complicated. Sorry, uh, uh, the, the general case is much more complicated. General means, again, that T, so this 
stationary kinetic vector field is said to be static if in addition to the fact that it's a kinetic vector field, it satisfies another integrability condition, which we mentioned last time, but I'm not going to talk about it now. And uh, so now we uh, look at the general case, so general stationary case. So there, there is a beautiful result due to Carter and Robinson, which is, which is at least 40 years old, uh, which says that if in addition to stationarity, you also know that the space-time is actually symmetric, then uh, you are in care, right? Okay, so that's, that's a result which is based on elliptic theory. It's, based on, it's a reduction to harmonic maps. Beautiful result, uh, highly non-trivial and well known. And then in addition to that, the other result which was known is a result, it's an observation due to Hawking, which was that uh, if you also assume analyticity, uh, then the result is true in general. In other words, analyticity and stationarity implies axial symmetry. Okay? And I mentioned a little bit about this result last time. And I also mentioned that this result is not very good uh, in that uh, this assumption of analyticity can almost never be, I mean, essentially doesn't come naturally uh, from the equations. And the reason very simply was that if t is uh, time-like, in the region where t is time-like, the equations reduce, the Einstein equations in those regions, reduce to an elliptic system. And therefore, elliptic system naturally have analytic solutions, real analytic solutions. But if you are in the ergo region where t becomes space-like, you are, you can, there is nothing you can do, right? There is no way, I mean, the equations become hyperbolic. Even more complicated, there is a transition between elliptic and hyperbolic. These are mixed problems which are extremely complicated in general. There is no reason to expect analyticity. And R equal to M is a limit between space-like and time-like for T. So I, I'm really talking now about the general case, right? I mean, I'm a stationary, so I'm not, I cannot talk about that. Schwarzschild is R equal to 2M. So now it's, I just have a horizon. So in, in care, in, in Care is a little bit more complicated. It's not R equal to 2M. It's another value. It's this root. But, but you do have an ergo region. You have a non-trivial ergo region. In Schwarzschild, you don't have an ergo region. It's just in care. Okay. okay. In any case, uh, this uh, Hawking result is, uh, is only interesting insofar is that it tells you that all explicit solutions of uh, Einstein equations, stationary explicit solutions of the Einstein equations, have to be care. But if you, look for, if you look beyond explicit, then uh, there is no, ch no, no reason to uh, think that this uh, tells you anything. Yes? Does it follow from Hawking the result that, that at least in the region where T is time-like, if that region exists, the solution must be curved? No, of course not, because you, you can't, uh, yeah. You need the whole thing. You need the whole, I mean, it's a global, you need the whole global picture in order to come. Conclude anything. Okay, so now. Uh, why, why is it clear that you need? Perhaps you don't need to know the whole solution. Perhaps yeah, you can show that if, yeah, if it's you, outside you, certain spheres. No, but you, you can't. Everything starts. Uh, you construct the axial symmetric. Uh, exactly. Everything starts from. I, I'll, I'll mention about this in a second. Everything starts from the horizon. The whole construction is based on something uh, that happens in the horizon. If you remember, I mentioned last time. Yeah, let me repeat that argument of Hawking, right? So. So you, you have, so this is the, uh, a general stationary solutions. It's not too complicated under the assumptions we have made to show that a horizon exists, okay? It's a soft argument. So there exists a horizon. Uh, and uh, it's also not difficult to show that the Keeling vector field, the, the, time, the stationary Keeling vector field becomes space-like, but it rotates. It, it, in other words, it's tangent on the horizon, and therefore it rotates along the horizon. Okay, so it does something like this. And uh, from that fact, it's not hard to say that there is another killing vector field exactly on the horizon, okay? A second killing vector field, which this time is in this direction. In other words, it's, it's, it's exactly tangent to the generators of the horizon. The horizon, remember, is a null hypersurface, so it has null generators. So the second killing vector field is going to be, uh, will be tangent to these null generators. Okay, so in other words, you get a, a second kinetic vector field, but this is a kinetic vector field only on the horizon. And the next thing you have to extend in the interior. And that's where analyticity is used. In other words, analyticity is used exactly near the horizon in order to extend, right? And once 
you have analyticity everywhere, the result, the observation of Hawking, is that you can extend the, the second kinetic vector field everywhere, and therefore you reduce yourself, you reduce yourself to the to this case, right? The axially symmetric case, and therefore, okay. But it's a it's a very complicated argument, and in fact the the depth of the argument is in here. This one, what he did is rather soft, and and obviously is not is not at all conclusive in general. Okay, so uh, so this is. Uh, this is uh, uh, exactly uh, the observation of Hawking that there exists a second kinetic vector field along the horizon. Now, you see, now you, once you have a second kinetic vector field, you could do the following thing. So you, you, here is why things are not going to work. So you have, you have the uh, horizon. And uh, you have a second kinetic vector field, uh, so you, you have now, let's call it, say, Z, okay? It's actually called, uh, it's actually called K, but uh, if, you know, if, you, if you know how to extend K from the horizon everywhere inside, and you have T, K and T, you can show by a simple argument that K and T generate together, ge they generate a, a rotation, so they generate a, a second kinetic vector field, another kinetic vector field, which is actually uh, an axial uh, kinetic vector field. All right, so the question is, <laughs> given k here, can I extend it? Well, k has to be extended as a kinetic vector field, of course. So I have to have the alpha k beta. So it has to satisfy the kinetic equation equal to 0. <laughs> if I take a, sec a second derivative here and I commute derivatives, and use the fact that, uh, that uh, the space is Ricci flat, I get, uh, uh, so this will be zero. It's easy to see that this is going to be zero. And you'll be left with essentially a wave equation for k is equal to zero. <laughs> All right? So in other words, you want to extend it in such a way that the lambertian of k is equal to zero. So you have k given here and here, right, from Hawking's argument. And you think, well, maybe I should, I should extend it like this, the ambition of k is equal to zero, because this is at least consistent with the fact that k should be killing. So what is the problem? Well, the problem you can see already in much simpler situations. Imagine that uh, I have an alcon. So imagine that I have sort of an alcon like this in Minkowski space. So I, I, I'm simplifying the situation to Minkowski space. So I have. I have a sphere here, and I have light cones going this way. And suppose I want to solve the ambition of phi is equal to 0 with data here and here. Right? So this is the initial data. is, is now a characteristic initial data. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm prescribing data here and here, and I want to solve this one. So you say, well, you should be able to do it. Well, it turns out that it's an ill post problem. Right? So it's an ill post problem. Uh, you don't have solutions. So solutions of these equations don't exist in general. So they exist, of course, if, if everything is analytic, if the data here is analytic, then you, do, you can extend, of course, by cauchy kowalewski But in general, you cannot, and that's sort of a major obstacle. Right? So this is the reason why, uh, why Hawking argument will not work. You'll not be able to extend it naturally uh, unless you have analyticity. OK, so this is uh, typical to ill post problems. So ill post problems play a major role in, in mathematical physics. Partial differential equations, there are many, uh, many uh, situations where these things occur. And, and of course, they are very interesting. And there are methods developed by mathematicians to deal with them, which I'll talk about it a little bit later. So our approach <coughs> is, in fact, of, of based on these new methods, uh, which were developed by mathematicians, to deal with issue with ill post problems. So it happens that. You can see it from here, actually, already, <laughs> that though if I give you an arbitrary phi 0, I will not be able to solve this equation. If I, I, I can do something, nevertheless, which is interesting, which is that if I have two solutions, I can show that uh, if they coincide here, they will have to coincide everywhere. Okay? So, so uniqueness still holds, even though you don't have existence. Uniqueness holds. So there are, in other words, ill post problems for which uniqueness holds, but existence doesn't. So the, the whole idea of our approach to the uh, rigidity problem is to use this, uh, this, uh, 
geometric continuation arguments based on uniqueness, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, which also require this analytic tool, which are called Ar Carleman estimates. All right, so let me, let me mention, the, first of all, the main obstruction. So what is the main obstruction? Uh, yeah, maybe uh, let me actually talk about this a little bit later. So let me go on uh, and mention some, the, some interesting results, which are a little bit simpler than the general uh, rigidity problem. So again, the general rigidity problem is to show that uh, in the absence of analyticity, I still have uniqueness of the Kerr solution. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, I want to show you some results which are a little bit easier than that, so, but which are still interesting because they, uh, they show the importance of some concepts which play a role, of course, in the big problem. Okay, so here, here, here is the first uh, kind of problem. Suppose I have a manifold, M, which is Ricci flood. So, uh, in fact, actually, in this kind of result, I don't even need G to be uh, Lorentzian. It can be any, it can be any pseudo-Romanian uh, metric, right? But anyway, in particular, it's Lorentzian, so it's minus plus plus plus. And also, that dimension here doesn't matter. I can take any, any dimension. So, uh, so uh, suppose I have a Kinnick vector field Z, right? So, Z is Kinnick. in this domain O, right? So I have a domain here, and I have the, the, the boundary of the domain. So this is uh, the boundary. And uh, so I know that Z is skinning, and I want to extend it. I want to extend it outside, right? So th this is, in a sense, what Hawking was trying to do, trying to have a, he had a Kinnick vector field exactly on the, uh, on the uh, horizon and wanted to extend it, right? So the issue of extension is what I'm going to address here. So uh, if everything is analytic, you don't even need this condition. So actually, you can replace the Einstein equation by analyticity. In fact, that's exactly what Hawking did. His result did not require the Einstein equations at all. Analyticity is like replacing the Einstein equation by the Cauchy-Riemann equations, so to speak, right? So, uh, so, uh, so in the case of analyticity, you don't need essentially any condition. You just need that Z is killing. And uh, you need some topological conditions that show immediately that Z can be extended everywhere. So in the analytic case, there is no issue whatsoever, right? Simple topological conditions give you extensions of Z on the whole manifold, right? But of course, if the, if the manifold is smooth only, then... Zeta reminds me in the extension. Yeah, of course, I want Z to stay killing. Yeah, I want to extend it so that it's still killing, obviously. Yeah, otherwise, of course, you can have lots of extensions. But I, I want a Kinnick extension. So, uh, okay, so the question is, so what can you do now in the, in the uh, smooth re regime, in the non-analytic regime? So, of course, the results are going to be much more restrictive, but, uh, but interesting in the following sense. So, the result which I mentioned here is that if I look at the neighborhood of a point, P, and I assume that the boundary verifies a certain condition, which I call null convexity condition, okay? So if the null convexity condition, it's, it's called pseudo convexity in, for more general PDE, but in this case, it's much nicer to call it null convexity, right? So, uh, so the null convexity uh, condition can be expressed geometrically in this simple form, which is that if you take the Hessian of a function here, which defi a defining function of the boundary, in other words, I take a function f, which is zero the boundary, the boundary is equal to zero is, and is negative inside the domain and sufficiently smooth, right? So if I take the Hessian in the direction of any null vector field, which is tangent to the, to the boundary. So I take at all the tangent space at the boundary, in particular just at the point P is good enough. Uh, so it has to be null, so I'm looking only at null things, so g of x is equal to zero. Uh, then I want the Hessian in the direction of x to be negative at point P, okay? So that's a very simple condition, which is called the null convexity condition. So if this null convexity condition is satisfied, then the result says that z can be extended past P 
in a full neighborhood of the point P, and of course, Z will be killing in that neighborhood, right? So that's, that's the result. In addition, if X is perpendicular to T, then you are interested, so in, uh, there is a companion result. Maybe I'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, let's, let's just concentrate on, on uh, what's not red here. Okay, so that's a result. Uh, here is it again. So Z is killing in O. The boundary is strong in R convex. Strong in R convex means exactly this. Uh, then Z extends as a killing vector field to a neighborhood of the point P. All right, so this is... Uh, okay, so this is the first result that I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about it today. Now, here is a second result, uh, which is, uh, uh, in a sense, Slava. In a sense, this answers to uh, some of your questions, right? Uh, so here is a, a second result, which says the following. So let me describe the picture here. So again, you have the care solution. Think of it as a care solution. Take any point on the boundary, on the horizon, but not here. Take any point here, right? And uh, uh, the claim is that I can create, in a neighborhood of that point, I can create a new solutions of the Einstein equation, which is, different, which is exactly equal to care on this side, but which is different from care on the other side. It's stationary verifies the Einstein equation, but it doesn't have any additional kinetic vector fields, right? Okay, so it's, a, it's an obvious contradiction to uh, what Hawking wanted to do because obviously uh, it, it holds in the non-analytic case. In the analytic case, of course, it's, it, it, it's always true that you can extend, but in the non-analytic case, you can see that uh, 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 if I take any point on the boundary, uh, on the horizon, I will not be able to extend. Right? Because I can always, in other words, I'm not going to be extend in the sense of creating something which has a second killing vector field. Uh, so I, again, let me start again. I start to scale here, small neighborhood of a point P on the horizon. Uh, I can construct a solution in a small neighborhood of that point, which is exactly care on this side. It verifies the Einstein vacuum equations everywhere. It's stationary on the other side also, but it doesn't have any extra killing vector field. Yes. My, my basic confusion with the whole uh, way you present things is as follows. So you started by saying that uh, that outside where it is time-like, things are analytic. For this, you have no problem. Sorry. Then you said, okay, let's look inside. There, this argument does not com com uh, does not apply. So things get complicated, and now you're showing how they're complicated. But what about the outside? What if I sit outside and start moving inside? Yeah, yeah. Outside things were analytic. Then at some point, you, starting, you, starting from the you expect that they're going to become non-analytic. Starting right? from sky? Starting from sky? In other starting words. from uh, R equal uh, 10M. But, uh, but I have no information there. I, have no inf I need an extra. You know that it's analytic there. But that's not good enough. Lots of analytic solutions. Uh, but suppose that you start moving inside. Are you sure that things will become non-analytic? Where they are going to become non-analytic? they will probably blow up somewhere. I mean, they will probably blow up even before the algorithm. I mean, they will be local. There's no way I can extend them in any reasonable way. No, but will the solution stay analytic? Perhaps it will. Well, they will stay analytic until they blow up. What will blow up? The solution. I mean, the solution exists only locally. So the, the only thing I can say with this... Uh, the, the, this the solution of what? You have a non... Okay, so you have a nonlinear problem, right? For each zero. I have a Killing vector field, which is, say, time-like, right? So I have, I have a point in my manifold where T is time-like. No, but the solution exists, exists uh, all the way to the horizon. We assume that no. we have a, what do you mean now? We already assumed that we have but, a black hole. But, we assume that we have a black hole. No, but I'm talking, about, I, I'm talking about the result which I want to apply. I want to apply a result about analytic, uh, uh, about, I, I, I can't, I can't say anything. I mean, uh, from the information that I have at this point, which is w way away from the horizon, I can't say anything else as I approach the horizon. I can't say anything. I have no, no way to control the solution that starts here, control it here. Yeah, the solution exists, you tell me, but so what? I, I don't have any way of connecting what's here with what's here. 
It's a non-linear problem. I, I, there's no way I can do that. Well, where is the surface where things can go wrong? It's the surface where T becomes spaceflight. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, so the, the information that I have from my analytic solution, starting from a point, yeah. will not even go all the way to here. The information is purely local. The information that I can extract is purely local. I, I don't understand what you want. I mean, okay, so the solution is analytic there, but so what? There are lots of analytic solutions. I can't tell anything. You, 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 you see what I'm saying? I mean, like you're going for the most pessimistic possibility. The most optimistic possibility is that the solution will actually be analytic also in cyber. You mean here? No, absolutely not. Why, why not? Because again, analytic, analytic solutions of a nonlinear, complicated nonlinear PDE exist only locally. They are defined only locally. They will blow up typically. And the information that I get from points here in this neighborhood of, of this point have nothing to do with the only information. The only information which I have is here. Here I know that there is a second Kinney vector field. There is no other information, right? I want to use this information. So I want to go, you have to go from here to here. I don't know how to do that, right? My first uh, impulse would be to try to cross this problematic surface. You know that on the right, on the surface, things... I can't. I can't. I can't. Right. And in the, the fact, there is absolutely no way you can do it. <laughs> okay. So uh, you, you can do something else. There is another thing that you can try to do. You can, you can come all the way from infinity because you can hope that also at infinity, at the, the boundary at infinity, you get some additional information. That's true. But th that also has never worked. So the, the, there are lots of difficulties also on, at infinity. There are difficulties which have to do with with somehow the metric at infinity is quite is pretty uh, irregular itself at infinity, so you you can't do it. I mean, people have tried. There are lots of lots of things that people have tried. They never worked. All right. Anyway, so uh, so this is uh, the second result. So uh, so let's with these two results. Uh, I might uh, give you some conclusions already. So there exists no other explicit stationary, s explicit stationary solution, so this is the result of Hawking. There exists no other stationary solutions close to an extremal Kerr or Kerr uh, Newman. Uh, and uh, 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 this is exactly the result that uh, I mentioned, which is a result of uh, uh, Ionescu, Alexakis, and myself, right? It also can be generalized. So I, I said it for care, but it can be generalized anyway. I, I, I will not say any words about this. So this says that if I'm sufficiently close to care, I have a stationary solution which is sufficiently close to care, then I'm in care. So how, how do I, okay, so let me, because pr probably I will not be able to say much more about uh, the problem. Maybe I should mention at least that much. All right, so uh, uh, how do you say that uh, you are close to care? So I have a stationary solution. So I, I have a solution of the Einstein equation. I have a, a, a Killing vector field T, which is time-like uh, outside the ergo region, right? So this is at infinity. Uh, so uh, in, in this situation, we have introduced this additional tensor, which is a mass simon tensor. So, right, so this is a complex tensor, which has a property that if S vanishes, then uh, you are in care. And uh, therefore, the result, so this is uh, Alexakis, Ionescu, and myself, uh, says that uh, if S, this, this mass simon tensor is sufficiently small. So in other words, I have, a stationary solution uh, such that the mass simon, is sufficient, mass simon tensor is sufficiently small, then you are in care. Right? So, so th this is the only result that we have. I mean, only satisfactory result you have. There are many versions of this result, but uh, uh, they all need smallness. Uh, the full problem is far from being solved because we don't know how to do the large uh, deviations from the care solution. 
But we do have a conjecture, which again I mentioned last time, which is this conjecture was Ionescu and Alex Alexakis, which is a rigidity conjecture holds true, provided that there are no t trap null geodesics. So this is, uh, you see, the, the, the presence of, of uh, trap null geodesics uh, is easily seen that it has something to do with lack of null convexity. So the null convexity uh, fails, right? So if I start, if I start from the horizon, and uh, I try to extend this second killing vector field. So let's call it K. So if you remember, uh, Hawking produced a, a killing vector field on the horizon, and the point here was to extend. The, the importance of uh, Hawking's observation is that this killing vector field was defined everywhere, okay, on the horizon. So I have a, a killing vector field defined everywhere on the horizon. I need to extend it. And uh, 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 it turns out that in the spirit of this result that I mentioned here, the null convexity condition is actually verified in a neighborhood, in a very, very small neighborhood of this, uh, uh, of the horizon, right? And as a consequence, because of this, I can extend. So this is the result that I just mentioned. Or, or rather, maybe um, slightly uh, a variant of this result. The, this is, the result was quite local here. I need something which is global. But in any case, a s relatively simple variant of that result will allow you to extend the Kinney vector field slightly away from the horizon. Right? And then, uh, then if you want to keep going, so you want to, you want to continue to extend, at some point you hit null geodesics, you hit trapped null geodesics, trapped region. And as you hit the, the trapping region, this null convexity will just evaporate. In fact, the null convexity, instead of being strict null convexity, it becomes zero, right? right? So in other words, we're having, instead of having the second, the Hessian, instead of having the condition df x, x is negative, there it becomes actually zero, and I'm dead. I cannot extend it any longer, okay? So that's, uh, so the, the trapping is a serious, a serious uh, obstruction to extension. So, uh, so what do you do? Well, uh, it turns out that since you are only interested in stationary solutions, so I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in extending all possible solutions. I'm interested in extension only the solutions which verify Li T of G is equal to zero. Right, and this is sort of a global thing. I mean, th you know, th th this is verified everywhere. Uh, uh, by the definition of stationarity. And as a consequence, and it's not very hard to see, as a consequence, the only obstruction that you see are not all, so here if you remember, these are null vector fields, right? So, but in reality, because of that condition, I'm only interested in those vector fields which are perpendicular to T, right? So the only obstructions for the problem of stationarity, when I know that I have a stationary vector field, uh, are in those directions which are null and for which g of xt is equal to zero, okay? So that's the notion of t-trap null geodesic. A, a null geodesic is said to be trapped if it stays in a finite region. It says to be t-trapped if it also stays perpendicular to t. And these are the only obstructions, right? So as long, uh, as those don't exist, you are fine. And in fact, in care, they don't exist. Okay, so it's easy to see. This is a calculation. In care, you can show that there are no t trapped null geodesics. So there are plenty of trapped null geodesics, but none of them is t trapped. And that's fundamental because it plays a major role also in stability, in the stability problem. All right, so, uh, so it's because of this that in a neighborhood of care, you can do it. You can still do it. So if the mass simultaneous is sufficiently small, it means you are in a neighborhood of care, then this condition is still verified in a neighborhood of care, and you can do it. And uh, the finally, and I'll finish with this uh, rigidity, uh, there is this conjecture of Alex Akis and Esken and myself, which is that rigidity conjecture holds true, provided there are no t trap null geodesics, right? So I don't need any smallness condition. I don't need mass simultaneous to be small. I just the conjecture is that as long as there are no, so it's a purely geometric condition, as long as there are no t trap null geodesics, then, uh, 
then uh, we are in CAD. And then, as I mentioned last time, it's not at all clear that, uh, that uh, but, I mean, I, I would think that the conjecture is true, but I don't believe that you can rule out t trabnal geodesics from abstract principles, right? So t trabnal geodesics probably do exist, and therefore there exist probably, there exist probably uh, exceptional cases to the rigidity conjecture. In other words, they probably, probably there are some very isolated space times uh, which are stationary, which are verify all the other conditions that you need, and yet they are not, uh, they are not care, right? And uh, well, I wanted, but unfortunately, I lost it. I lost a lot of time at the beginning. I wanted to give you some sense of the proofs of these things. I would not be able to do it. I might. I just want to say that uh, this T null convexity condition. So this, this kind of results here, which are highly non-trivial in the, their own right, uh, require require a lot of geometric analysis. Uh, based on Carleman estimates, so it's uh, uh, sort of geometric versions of Carleman estimates which are needed. Uh, but I will not. I, I don't think I should say anything more because I won't have the time. Uh, maybe I'll go to the conclusions again. So there exists no other explicit stationary solution. There exists no other stationary solutions close to an external care. Uh, ex uh, external, not extremal. I don't know why I said extremal. Sorry, I apologize. Not extremal. It's uh, external. Uh, uh, then the rigidity con conjecture is satisfied. And also, finally, there is also this result that I mentioned, which I think it's it's actually very interesting. Uh, the result that that locally you cannot do extensions. Typically, if I start from some point on the horizon and I look only locally, in other words, I'm not using the full global information along the horizon, then I cannot do the extension, right? So the, the, reason, the reason this is important because it, it shows you that the, 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 what allows you to have this null convexity condition is the intersection of the two horizons. So it's, it's here that this null convexity condition is verified. But, but it fails here and certainly it fails here, right? So locally, I will never be able to extend, unlike what Hawking did, and certainly uh, uh, I, the only way I can do it is if, this, uh, if, I, if I start from the intersection of the two horizons. Okay, so this may be, I don't know, it's already uh, 25. So sh shall we take maybe a few minutes and then I'll start talking about stability. Instead of talking about rigidity, I'll start talking, uh, I mean, instead of saying more about rigidity, which of course, interesting thing would be to prove these results that I mentioned, in particular this one. This, I think, has a very nice and uh, very pretty proof which exemplify the importance of geometric ideas, but uh, let me not go into it because I want to talk about uh, the most complicated problem in connection with this, uh, with this uh, what I call the test of reality, which is the problem of stability. And this is clearly the, the most important problem, right? I mean, it's by far the most important problem in, uh, in connection with uh, with this uh, test of reality, and of course, it, it, you know, obviously, physically, it's immensely interesting because if the if it so happened that these solutions are unstable, then obviously the very concept of a black hole, uh, which is based on the Kerr solutions, will go out the, win the window. Right? It will have to find other explanations for what the astrophysicists see. Uh, so, but hopefully, they are stable, and let's. Let's see why. All right, so first of all, condition A smaller than that means that it doesn't rotate too fast. It doesn't rotate too fast, exactly. Exactly, very good, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so here is a conjecture. Uh, so again, here is a picture of the Kerr solution, right? We are interested only in the external part. And in order to formulate uh, this stability, I have to take a space like hypersurface. I take any I take an arbitrary space like hypersurface, which, which looks roughly like this. It goes from here to here. But again, I'm interested only in this part, or maybe to go a little bit beyond, but not much. And I look at the restriction of the Kerr solution to this space like hypersurface. It will give me an initial data set, right? So the initial data set is a trivial initial data set of the Kerr solution. And then 
I'm going to, I want to make now a small perturbation of it, right? So I change the care solution somewhere by very little, right? And of course, I, I want to change it in such a way that the uh, constraint equations are still satisfied. Remember that the constraint equations are very important in general relativity. But anyway, this is not a big deal. You can always do that. So you can always find perturbations of the care solutions which verify the, uh, the constraint equations. You look at those initial data and you, you start, you look at the maximal global hyperbolic development, which is a concept we discussed last time, which means you extend the solution as, as far as you can, right? The danger, of course, will be that it stops in finite time. In other words, uh, observers which live on, uh, on the solution will hit uh, some singularity at some point and they, they will be destroyed, right? So they exist only for, for a short time. Of course, the stability will have to mean global stability. In other words, this maximum global hyperbolic development will have to be complete, right? Okay, so this is what it says. Small perturbation of a given exterior care solution have maximum future developments, which in fact converge to a, a care solution, but not necessarily the one you started with. So this is very important. You, you don't necessarily go back to the same solution. It may be another solution, right? And that's what makes the problem hard. I mean, other things that make the problem hard, but this is one of the reasons why it's hard, okay? Because you don't know a priori, you don't know where you would converge. Okay, so let, let's, uh, let me talk a little bit about, uh, this, this is a quotation from Chandra Sehar, that, which was, I don't know, uh, he has this beautiful book uh, on, on mathematical theory of black holes. Uh, and uh, this is what he said, the treatment of perturbations of care spacetime has been prolixious in its complexity. Perhaps at a later time, the complexity will be unraveled by deeper insights. But meantime, the analysis has led into a realm of the Rococo, splendorous, joyful, and immensely ornate. So of course, Chandra Sekar was sort of uh, a great admirer of, uh, of uh, art and beauty. And uh, he thought that this subject is very, is very beautiful, but very Rococo, unfortunately. Uh, and, uh, but he thought that at a later time, it will be, the beauty will be unraveled and things will become simpler. Despite 50 years of theoretical progress and the wealth of numerical and indirect astrophysical observations, this conjecture is still open, right? And I, I'll try in, in the rest of this lecture, I'll try to tell you what's known. All right, so first of all, uh, there were, I'll, I'll go very fast about these results and then I'll mention again later on. But what's known is uh, only linear stability. So linear results. So what, 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 what happened, I'll discuss more about this. You can actually linearize the Einstein equations. But of course, you, you have to be careful because when you linearize the Einstein equations, you have to take into account the gauge. So you, you, you have to remember that the solution is actually a class of equivalence of solutions. So the gauges are very important. You have to linearize in such a way that, uh, that what you get is, is gauge invariant. And that's not easy, but anyway, it can be done. And uh, this was understood by physicists reasonably well. There, was, uh, there were some results of Schwarzschild, uh, sorry, uh, the results in Schwarzschild by, by starting with Wheeler in 1957, Reggie Wheeler, the, the, the very uh, influential paper that they wrote, uh, just on the linear stability of Schwarzschild. There was uh, some results of uh, Dina Veshara and Zerili in 1970. And then uh, for CARE, the most important results are due to Teukolsky, Press Teukolsky, 1973. Uh, all these results are on linear stability, but linear stability done the way physicists do, which is they, uh, they expand, they do some kind of expansions in, in uh, uh, spherical harmonics, or, or in the case of care, it's a little bit more complicated. And, uh, and uh, they, they, in other words, they do, they, they decompose the solutions in modes and they, they look, they are interested only in the mode stability, right? So they want to see that the modes don't explode somehow. So, uh, so the lack of exponentially growing modes is what they are interested. These results gave some indication that, uh, that uh, there are no exponentially growing modes, but the true result on this mode stability was due to Whiting in 1989, where he gave a sort of a complete picture almost complete picture, actually, of uh, the fact that there are no exponentially growing modes, okay? So that's, that's was, that was in 1989 by Whiting. Now, uh, 
uh, this is declared victory, of course. You, uh, typically, if they show a result, then they immediately claim that they understand the whole thing, often. And uh, uh, I just here, I want to point out that if lack of exponential growing modes for the linearized equations was enough to deduce nonlinear stability, then the presence of shock waves, extreme sensitivity to the data, and turbulence in fluids will be ruled out. Right? So if you think that exponential, lack of exponential growing modes is enough to understand stability of the nonlinear problem, then you have a problem because in all these cases, when you linearize for all these phenomena, when you linearize, you see immediately that there are no exponential growing modes, and yet there is all. You see, for high reliance numbers, you see that there are exponentially growing modes. I'm sorry. For turbulence, you see that for high reliance numbers, there are exponentially growing modes. Yeah. Well, for for high reliance numbers, you see that. Yeah, but 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 you have many other instabilities for which there are no exponential growing modes. So okay, the, the typical example here is a typical example, which is uh, typical to shock waves. Right? So ut plus uux is equal to zero. When you linearize, you just get ut equal to zero. <laughs> and of course... Linearize not just around zero, but around other... Things. No, no, okay, but that's not, that, that, that's not the point. The point is... That, but when I linearize, I linearize around Kerr, or I linearize around, around Minkowski, or I linearize around, around something which is given to me. So this, in this case, I linearize around the trivial solution. And nevertheless, the, uh, so it's always linearized around one solution, not more, right? So here I take, I just take u equal constant, for example, or I take u equal to zero. Around all solutions that you can come up with. No, but that's not that's not how the linear stability is done. There's just no way. For example, you don't realize. No, that. it's done relative to care. So I fix the care. So I fix one solution and I linearize around it. I don't linearize around all of them. That, that's much more complicated. I mean, nobody can do that. Right? So it, it, the, the linearization is always done relative to a given solution. Anyway, we, we can argue more about this later. Right? I think your turbulence remark is out of place, really. Because okay, well, let's, let's uh, discuss Reynolds it. numbers. Uh, okay, let's, dis l l let's discuss it later, okay? Uh, okay, so uh, I, claim, I claim that this is true also in, in turbulence, but we'll discuss it later. So. Uh, so the weak linear instability is to be expected in view of uh, final care differs from the ones we perturb, diffeomorphic covariance of the Einstein vacuum equations, uh, stability requires quantitative decay of the final state, uh, and uh, leading uh, to lack of decay for the linearized field. So, uh, so this is uh, 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 something about what we'll need to have in order to, in order to uh, prove stability. I'll talk about this later on. So let me actually go to, uh, let me actually go to a sort of a more concrete discussion about the kind of stabilities and instabilities that you see in linearized, uh, for linearized gravity. Okay, so first of all, uh, here is a case solution again. So this you have seen, so I'm not going to say much more. Okay, so let me, let me talk about uh, Let's talk about uh, so I, I'm going to address exactly the issue raised by Slava. So let's let's discuss it uh, in full generality. So let's imagine that I have a nonlinear problem that I, I have to solve. N of u is equal to zero. Right? So this can be an ODE or a partial differential equation, that can be something very general. <laughs> and let's assume that I have a solution. <laughs> So this is equal to zero, right? And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I want to talk about various notions of stability. So, uh, so let's, for example, you can think of phi zero to be uh, not just any solution, but say a stationary solution, right? So something which doesn't depend on time. So the, the simplest notion of uh, stability, which of course we know already for ordinary differential equation, is, a pro is that of orbital stability, which is that if I take a, a perturbation, so I, I take a psi, I look for solutions of the nonlinear equations which have uh, a small psi perturbation. Let's say initially the perturbation is small and I want to know what happens for a long time, right? So let's say at time t equals zero, I know that psi is small. And uh, uh, the, 
the issue of orbital stability is whether psi stays bounded for all time. Right? Okay. Asymptotic stability. Asymptotic stability uh, is uh, the question of uh, whether not only psi stays bounded for all time, but the perturbation tends to zero. In other words, phi zero plus psi tends to tends back to the original solution phi zero. Right. So uh, the second type of uh, kind of stability questions that you want, or I might say, if you really want to understand this, the first thing that typically you do is you linearize. So you look at the linearized equation and you want to understand what kind of uh, behavior for the linearized equations you have, which you later on will transfer it to the Noe equation. So first of all, there is the issue of mod stability. Uh, and uh, uh, in other words, I look at the linearized equation and I decompose it into modes, right? So I look at some kind of, I, I look at the, the eigenvalues of the linearized equations and I say, I show that there are no growing modes. Okay, so in fact, mode stability in that case will mean that I, I have to prove that there are no growing modes. Uh, the lack of growing modes by itself is however, and this is already, I'm addressing your issue, lack of, uh, even if I'm able to show that there are no growing modes, this by itself doesn't impro even imply boundedness of the solutions. Okay? And there are counter examples where you can show that there are no growing modes and yet the solutions are not bound. For PDs, not for ordinary differential equations, so P for PDs. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that you might want beyond boundedness, and this is something that it's absolutely essential if you want to study the full nonlinear problem. So if you are just interested in linearization, if you're interested in the nonlinear problem, boundedness is not good enough. Right? It's just too weak an information because in the nonlinear problem, at some point, you'll have to integrate. The, the corrections to the linearized equations will have to be integrated. And you have to integrate it by all time. And boundedness will just simply not be enough because you don't have any integrability. Excuse me, Sandu, for uh, ordinary differential equations, you can have polynomial power types. So even for uh, ordinary differential equation, you, have, you can have a uh, Jordan block of polynomial power type. Yes, yeah. Okay, fine. So that's a good, that's a very good point. So even for the ODEs, this is not uh, sufficient. It's another question. You say there is no exponential mode, but are there polynomially growing uh, modes? For yeah, so th this, this question uh, here should be for growing modes, polynomial or exponentially, right? Now, uh, having no exponentially growing modes does not exclude the possibility uh, that there are uh, growing modes, right? But even if you don't have growing modes, if you have boundedness of all the modes, it doesn't mean that you have boundedness. And certainly, boundedness will have no, you see, Slava, that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, even boundedness will be very far away from nonlinear stability. So again, uh, well, I, I say, of course, mathematically speaking, you are right, but it, no, yeah. it's not like in physics, we don't know that you have to be careful and that it doesn't always imply, but for okay. every set of situations no, that you say you should be careful, there are tricks. Okay, so let, let yeah, okay, fine, but, but that's not the statement. The statement, the statement uh, about, about uh, the problem of stability of, of the care solution was very clear. So if, you, you, if the linearized equations around a fixed care has no exponential growing modes, that's it. That, you have, so that's wrong, right? And that what I meant about, uh, for example, what I meant about, uh, about uh, the Euler equation is that if you look at uh, u dot grad u is equal to zero. So you have the Euler equations. And I start, again, I, I'm just starting that u equals zero. There's no turbulence around u equals zero. Of course there is. You have turbulence if you have. But you can have, but you can have turbulence too because, because this could blow up. Even if, if I make a very small perturbation of z with u equal to zero, this equation will blow up. And presumably they blow up is connected with turbulence. But ter okay, ter turbulence has to do ter turbulence has to do with this one, with Laplace of u equal to zero. But in the limit as nu is equal to zero, this equation is very relevant. Yeah, I agree with you that turbulence has is turbulence is, is, is something much more complicated, which has to do with the interaction between the Euler equation and the fact that nu here tends to zero, okay? But, but nevertheless, uh, you know, the, the fact that this actually around u equal to zero 
there's no exponential growing modes, and nevertheless, it's not stable. Okay, well, we can talk more about this later. Anyway, uh, but in the, case of, in the case of the black hole stability, the statement was very clear. If you linearize around K and there are no exponential growing modes, then you have stability of the, of the black hole. And that statement is clearly wrong. Uh, all right, so uh, uh, let me go on to the next statement. So the stationary case, uh, uh, we, we still want to look at the linearized problem. And I, I want to point out what, what can go wrong, even beyond. So again, I, I take a stationary solution. I look at the linearized problem, which is n prime of phi 0 psi is equal to 0. And uh, one thing that can happen, which is the worst, is that I can have exponentially growing modes. So in, if I have exponentially growing modes, I'm done. There's nothing I can do, right? But uh, there are other things that can happen. Namely, if I have a family of stationary solutions, so phi zero is just, phi zero is just one of my family. So I have phi lambda and lambda, lambda equal to zero. I have uh, my phi zero, but I have, in reality, a continuum family, which is the case, of course, of the Kerr solution. The Kerr solution has a two-parameter family, right? It's A and M. So if I'm looking in this general case, I'm looking uh, uh, at, at the family. So I'm looking at the fact that n of phi lambda is equal to 0, right? So this is a nonlinear problem. And I differentiate with respect to lambda. What I get is that d over d lambda of phi lambda at lambda equal to 0 is in the kernel of n prime of phi zero, right? So in, in other words, I have, I have an eigen, eigen function, if you want, of the linearized problem with zero eigenvalue, right? And this is, a, this is a clearly non-trivial, right? So it's a non-trivial eigenfunction. OK, so this is one thing that can happen. Whenever I have a continuous family, in my nonlinear PDE has a continuous family of stationary solution, I have that kind of, that kind of difficulty here in the sense that uh, there are zero eigenvalues, so of course zero eigenvalues can lead to instabilities. The second thing that I can have is that uh, uh, it could be that uh, my equation has some, admits some uh, class of diffeomorphism which takes solutions into solutions, right? So this is of course a case of uh, general relativity where for every given metric you have a whole family, you have a four, four uh, parameter class of diffeomorphism. So in this case, I can do exactly the same thing. I can take phi zero of psi lambda. So phi zero of psi lambda is still a solution because of the fact that this is uh, invariant. The equations are invariant relative to z diffeomorphism. And now if I differentiate with respect to lambda and I take lambda to equal to zero, I get uh, that d over d lambda of this thing here is also an eigen, eigenvalue, a non-trivial eigenvalue, uh, eigenfunction, I'm sorry and only eigenfunctions of my system. All right, so all these things can lead to degeneracy in principle, but in reality will show that, that somehow these are not so dangerous uh, in a sense which I'll explain it in a second. Now, the, finally, we have the in intrinsic instability of phi zero, which means if you have negative eigenvalues, then you are dead. Right? There is nothing you can do. I mean, in that case, you don't expect any, any stability. All right, so, uh, okay, so uh, here is, in the linearized case, here is what can happen. Again, uh, the presence of a continuous family of stationary states will have to imply, because of that instability, will have to imply that the final states may differ from the initial states phi zero. In other words, you make a perturbation of phi zero, but in, the, in, in reality, you don't converge back to phi zero. You converge back to something entirely different and that you'll have to find. In other words, the final state has to be found. The presence of a continuous family of invariant diffeomorphism requires us to track dynamically the gauge condition. So now you have another difficulty, which is that, that to solve the actual nonlinear problem, you have to track the diffeomorphisms, uh, which is sort of a problem of center of mass frame. You have to find the correct center of mass frame in which uh, the solutions do actually converge towards the final state. Right? So that's the second one. And, uh, and that uh, somehow uh, this kind of thing here is called modulation theory. So this is modulation theory is, is understood relatively well in simpler, in very simplified, much simpler problem. But in general relativity, of course, is much, uh, certainly much less understood. 
Now, uh, the way to think, therefore, in terms of linear stability, somehow, if you want to connect with these things here, is that uh, quantitative linear stability, in order to prove nonlinear stability, you want some concept of quantitative linear stability. In other words, I want, I want uh, that my linear theory should be such that after you account for this one and two, in other words, after you account for these eigenfunctions corresponding to zero eigenvalues, all solutions of this equation decay sufficiently fast. So it's not enough to have non-exponentially growing modes, but you actually have, in fact, decay. So and it has to, to decay, decay has to be sufficiently fast in order to have stability. Okay, so modulation, as I said, is just a method of uh, producing solution of the nonlinear problem, accounting of, by the, of these two things. In other words, you produce solution of the nonlinear problem by dynamically tracking down the final states and dynamically tracking down uh, this, uh, this gauge condition, right? The final gauge condition in which the problem makes sense. Yeah, sorry, you have something? Smaller. I wanted to say, so when this linear stability <coughs> physics result that you referred to, right, it was more than just absence of growing modes, right? Because there was a, a very detailed classification of quasi-normal modes, things <coughs> are to infinity, okay, things to going on to horizon. So you cannot say that physicists like stopped, oh, nothing grows fine. Let, let me, there was little understanding achieved, which actually, you know, well, plays the role for, for the result about gravitational waves that you like to cite, right? The ring yeah. down phase, the ring down phase of that. So Slava, uh, let, let, me, let me apologize a little bit. Let me, let me apologize. I didn't mean at all to say that the physicists have done nothing on the country. The, 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 uh, the, the fact that there are no expansion growth is a highly non-trivial result. Not right. just the growth, not just the absence of growth. There is also exponential decay for many perturbations, which also this linearized analysis reveals. But it has nothing to do with the, the full non It has nothing to do with the, well, Look, we'll discuss it. But it has nothing a, to do if it's what the people see in experiments for gravitational waves. But that's something else, what they see, else. what they see. So, but it doesn't, but the proof, Look, there is a difference. It's not fully rigorous, but it's, it's not at all rigorous. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not at all rigorous. It's, it's very nice. It's very pretty. You get very, very pretty pictures, but it's not at all rigorous. It's, it's very far from being rigorous. It's the truth. And you but maybe. To show that maybe it's the truth. Maybe it's the truth, but the truth is not, is not expressed in any, <laughs> is not explained in any theoretical way in terms of uh, sort of understanding the non-linear problem, the non-linear character of the equation. L listen, so let, let's talk about this later because yeah, yeah, I, I, have, I, I, love to, I love to argue with you about this. All right, so let's, uh, 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 okay, so once, I, once this is discussed, to prove non-linear stability, you have to, as I said, <laughs> find this gauge condition, which you have to find dynamically, you need a robust mechanism for deriving sufficient decay because otherwise you don't have uh, you don't have any chance of, of producing either the final state or the or the the correct gauge condition. You need a, a version of the null condition with respect to the gauge. Uh, the, what this means is that somehow the structure of the nonlinear problem has to be such that uh, uh, you get. Uh, you, uh, you get certain cancellations. So maybe, since this has something to do with, with this argument that I have with Slava, let me mention uh, something connected with it. Okay, so you see, the Einstein equations, in a sense, can be viewed at a, simplified, at a very, very simplified level as being not too different from equations like this, the inversion of phi. So this is 3 plus 1 down inversion. Uh, and here you have something which is, uh, say, a quadratic nonlinearity, and I take the simplest possible one, right? So I take dt phi squared, right? Okay. And I do the most trivial thing, which is what I mentioned earlier. I want to take, I look at the stability of phi equal to zero. So I look at the initial data, phi equals zero, dt phi equal to zero. So, and I perturb it, in other words, I take epsilon here, some small, something small, Epsilon something small, right? And uh, and of course, there are no exponential growing modes. Obviously, I mean this is uh, at a linear level. The problem is trivial because at a linear level, is just the inversion of phi is equal to zero, right? And yet this problem 
uh, blows up in finite time. And in fact, if you, if you look at the, the quasi-linear equivalent of this, so for example, if you look at something like dt phi, dt t phi, which is quasi-linear, the corresponding solution is actually a shock wave. So it typically, uh, you know, shock waves, of course, occur in reality, physical reality, and they have nothing to do with exponential growing modes. They, they are an instability uh, which is far deeper than exponential growing mode. Exponential growing mode, you know, at the level of exponential growing mode, this actually not only is bounded, this decays. So phi actually decays like a power of t, say. But is this a good model for what's going on in the black hole? Because what is this dt phi squared? But give me a good model. I mean, you know, it's part of, part of what a mathematician has to do is to find good models. No, but, but for example, physics would say that perturbations of black hole either escape to infinity in the form of gravitational waves or fall inside the horizon. Where is this intuition in your discussion? But this is even more trivial. But this is even more trivial than that. It's a, there is no black hole, it's even easier, everything goes to infinity. It's a, the simplest possible thing. I don't understand what you are saying. I mean, this is the easiest possible thing. It's much easier than a black hole problem. A black hole problem has many other issues. You see, the black hole problem has these trapped null geodesics, for example, which are much more complicated than this case. So I, I, not re, I, not understand, I, don't, I don't really understand what you are saying. I mean, this is by far the simplest possible problem that you can think of in terms of uh, black hole stability. It, as, a, as a bad model, it's not a good model because obviously what, what happens in, for the Einstein equations, if you take into account the gauge condition, you, you can show that these kind of interactions don't exist. Is it a model for outgoing or for ingoing part of the radiation? This is for outgoing, of course. You are in the whole space. So it's for outgoing, going to infinity. There is nothing incoming here. I mean, the incoming is... No, there is part of your perturbation which will fall. Well, they, 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 there is... <laughs> There is back, uh, how do you call it, the back, uh, the back scattering, uh, right? Which exists because of the nonlinear problem, but everything moves out to infinity. So it's a much more, it's infinitely more trivial than, than the black hole stability problem. Again, in the black hole stability problem, there are many other issues, I'll talk about it. But one of them, for example, is just this trapping, right? Which you don't have in Minkowski space. There is no, there is no trapping here. And the fact that the linear level, look at this. I mean, you know, what can you do? You can't do anything better. You get, not only you get that there are no exponential growing modes, phi decays like t to the minus one. And yet these things form shock waves, right? So it's trapping, it's not at infinity. Because at infinity, I would expect that given that you already proved the theorem of stability of Minkowski space, by the time things escape to infinity, they will remain small. Well, okay, but you have the, you have the stability of Minkowski space. In the case of stability of Minkowski space, there are no exponential growing modes, and yet it's a hard problem. Right? So... Uh, no, but it's just, you know, I don't understand. So physicists develop a certain amount of intuition. How they physicists are great. Look, I'm not, we are not talking about physicists are great. The only point... Slava, sorry. I have the highest opinion. I have the highest opinion of, of physicists. All I'm saying is that often they declare victory when it's not the case. Okay, that's all I'm saying. They, they made, did they make very important contributions? Absolutely. No, but I'm sorry, no. as an observer, here there are some students who are mathematicians, right? You, you're basically telling them that you have to reinvent the wheel. Start from scratch, physicists didn't do anything. You should just like reanalyze from scratch. Well. It's intuition about things going there, falling into the horizon and so on, this is nowhere present. You say that intuition is not important, what is important uh, is this example. But this intuition is trivial, the fact that things go into the horizon, everybody knows. You look at the solution, you see that things go into the horizon, I don't understand your point. I mean the horizon, the event horizon is already, the, the event horizon, you, you look at the picture, you have the event horizon, obviously things go into the horizon. What is, a, what is this great intuition? That what about quasi-normal modes? Do they play have no play a role in this, absolutely no role at this stage. Now, they play a role, they play a role in, the, in the observations, I agree, but that's a totally different story. That's beyond, once you have, you see, once you have the stability, I mean, once, for example, in this case, once I have stability, I can go on and talk about, uh, about more, uh, refined features of the solutions. Quasi-normal quasi modes are refined features of the solutions are not really, have nothing to do with the fact that they are, that the solutions don't blow up before, uh, uh, right? So it, it could very well be that if I make a perturbation of the case solution, I'll get solutions which actually form singularities. 
How do you know that they don't from singularities? For me, it's an interesting thing to learn that you think it's a, it's a prime feature. For me, I, it looked like it was, it, it goes hand in hand with stability, but perhaps I'm wrong. You go, go hand in hand with stability? Yeah, the existence of quasi-normal modes and the elevation is something which goes hand in hand with stability. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's an extra feature of the equations which is very interesting and relevant, but it has nothing to do with uh, the, the actual issue of whether solutions of these equations are, are global or not. Stability of Minkowski space, I don't have to know anything about quasi-normal mode. Quasi Can you tell us what means quasi-normal mode? Well, so it's... <laughs> well, look, I, sh I'm, I apologize here. I should let you go ahead, sorry. No, but I should also apologize because I, I made myself misunderstood. I, I don't mean to say at all. On the contrary, you'll see later on. I, if you had a little bit more patience, I would have talked about what the physicists have done in more details, and you see that it's extremely important <laughs> what they have done. It's just that, 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 you know, the only statement I made is that the physicists often declare victory when the victory is not there. That's all I'm saying. I mean, it doesn't mean that they, what they have done is not interesting. And in fact, not only interesting, but fundamental, in fact. <laughs> right? Right, sorry. Uh, sorry to everybody. Uh, so maybe I should finish and, and continue next, next time. Uh, right. Yeah, all, all I wanted to do is, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll show this slide and then I'll finish. So, uh, if you, we talked about the general uh, problem, right? I, I talked about, uh, about uh, the problem of stability in, in general. So, I had uh, n of phi is equal to zero and I, I, I looked at, <laughs> I looked at stability around phi zero and we discussed various, uh, various types of stability then, and linear stability and linear instabilities. But now let's go to the actual Einstein equation. So for the Einstein equations, actual, the, uh, the role of this phi zero is of course a Kerr solution. So I have the Kerr solution and Ricci of it is equal to zero. Uh, all right, so we have indeed a two parameter family, so M and A are are parameters, which are continuous parameters. So I can do exactly what we did in that case. I can do it here, right? So I can, I can linearize the Einstein equations, right? So I find, that, I find that this derivative of G with respect to M is actually an eigenfunction corresponding to zero eigenvalue, right? So in other words, I have a whole family. I have a, a one parameter family of solutions, non-trivial kernel, in other words, non-trivial kernel here, this is two-dimensional, and in addition, I have this gauge, gauge invariance. So gauge invariance means now that if I, if I look at the one parameter group of diffeomorphisms, which is generated by a vector field, right? So, uh, uh, so I look at the vector field on my manifold, and I look at diffeomorphism, uh, the, diffeomorph the one parameter group generated by X, uh, I find out because of the, the fact that uh, phi t star of g and g are in fact the same, so the, the solutions are invariant with respect to this diffeomorphism, I immediately conclude that if I take the lead derivative with respect to this x of the metric g, uh, I, I get again that, the, the, that this is a zero, this provides a uh, an eigenfunction to zero eigenvalue, right? And of course, the, the whole group of diffeomorphisms is four-dimensional, right? So, which means that if I look now at the dimension of the kernel of this, uh, of this, uh, of this delta of Ricci, of this linearized Einstein equation, the, the dimension of the kernel is, is uh, two, which comes from this, and then I have four times infinity, which comes from, from this diffeomorphism. So in other words, this is an infinite dimensional, a highly infinite dimensional uh, kernel, and you can imagine that because of this, a problem is going to be very difficult. So uh, I should stop here. Okay, so I'll stop here. I don't know if there are any other questions. I, I apologize. Uh, yes.
that in principle it's worth to know from the beginning what could be the asymptotic mass. What would be the final mass, you mean? Yeah. No, absolutely not. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, you, you have to track it down. I mean, it's like in, you know, in modulation theory for simple nonlinear problem, you only find, you find the final state as... It's close to the initial one. It's close to the initial one, but you don't know a priori what it is. You cannot determine it from the data, in other words. You, you have to really do the whole dynamics in order to determine. So this is one major problem. But of course, the one with a kernel, in other words, the one with a gauge, is even more complicated. Because if you don't, you see, if you don't put yourself into the correct gauge, and that correct gauge also has to be dynamically constructed, if you're not in the correct gauge, you don't have decay. If I don't have decay, I, don't, I cannot control the nonlinear. Because you aim asymptotic stability immediately, but don't you try to do orbital stability with GC? Right, so orbital stability, you can never do orbital stability for a nonlinear, quasi-linear problem, right? So it's very rare that you can do directly orbital stability. For complicated quasi linear I mean, for example, you know, some... Sorry? I think I know an example. You can do it, but conditionally. For, for the waterways, there is a theorem by Milke where there is stability of some stationary solutions, but it's conditional to uh, global existence. But I, I, I mean, you can. Why, why not? But if I don't have global existence, I... Don't. It's another problem, you agree? I mean... <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I cannot, I don't know how to separate the two. I mean, yeah, in, in this kind of... You, the existence, I mean. you have to do both existence. In other words, you show, when, when you prove stability, you show that there are no other singularities, right? Which is, you know, con con you can say it's, it's cosmic censorship, a baby cosmic censorship model, right? Because there are no singularities close to a Kerr solution. Or we have the impression that the existence problem is more important than the stability, in a sense, in, in your... No, you, they are totally connected. You cannot do one without the others. We don't know. No, but I'm talking about this problem. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there are examples. There are examples, but I, I totally agree. I mean, there are all, all the examples which are due to uh, the, uh, Arnold has a whole set of examples which can, where you can prove non you can prove orbital stability directly, right, by using variational variational methods. But in this case, they don't work, right? So uh, whenever I have something, even something like this, I wouldn't know how to do it. Right? But in particular, if I have something quasi-linear, there is absolutely, I believe there is no way of, of doing one without the other. But of course, in a certain sense, you, you do both. You do both asymptotic stability and orbital, because your final state is not the original one you started with. Right? So, so it, 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 it's a. It's a combination of orbital and asymptotic stability, right? Orbital because the final state is different, asymptotic because you're actually converging to the final state, right? You're, it's not that you stay close to the final state, you converge to the final state, right? Yeah. Uh, can I follow up on, on the question that can you yes. predict the final mass? But presumably, to first order perturbation, you can derive some rigorous estimate on. Uh, First order perturbation. Uh, if you if your initial perturbation is expanded in quasi-normal modes, <laughs> then you could predict what is going to escape to infinity and what it will fall into the black hole. And assuming that this perturbative analysis, perturbative analysis, perturbative should make a rigorous estimate, which is of the same type. You can't. You cannot. I can't. So perturbative, the the, the perturbative analysis uh, the. So, for example, there is uh, the work of uh, your colleague, right, uh, Thibault, which has done a lot of beautiful work on, on, on uh, asymptotic analysis. None of this can be turned into proofs. I mean, the, 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 you know, and I'll, I'll show you why. I mean, it's very easy to see why it will not turn into proofs. So you, you have to develop completely different methods to do that. Right? You mean it's out of reach, or you think it's... Completely out of reach. Okay. Totally out of reach. I mean, I have to convince you, obviously, because you don't seem convinced at all. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to go. <laughs> I, we have another week if you are here next week. I'll try to convince you that it's very, very far from. So, uh, so it's a little bit, maybe from that point of view, it might be of interest to you. Because, indeed, say, in quantum history, which is even more complicated, uh, you, you have asymptotic analysis. But it's very hard to turn that asymptotic analysis into some kind of rigorous proof, right? And probably you require, you need different methods which are not perturbative. 
So in a sense, what we are doing is a development of such methods, but for these classical problems. Right? But absolutely, asymptotic analysis, you'll never be able to, to close with asymptotic analysis. So will you be here next week? I'll, we'll, we can. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, well, are you coming back? Are you coming back in July? I'll be here on Friday, but maybe not on Wednesday. Okay. All right. All right.